It is good to be together this morning. Welcome to everybody here in the sanctuary and to those of you online joining us this morning. Welcome as we gather to worship this morning uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you are online with us this morning and experiencing any tech difficulties, please feel free to text 403-560-2688 and we'll do what we can to resolve any issues you might be having. I just have a couple of quick announcements before we welcome one another. The first is this, um, well, three announcements actually. The youth are all gone. They're up at Gull Lake right now, and they'll be traveling home after lunch sometime, so please continue to pray for them as they've enjoyed decent weather up there uh, for winter camp, which has been fantastic. Uh, Secondly, not only are our youth gone, but much of our worship team, music team, is gone to various parts of the world, California, South Africa, Um, and so this morning we'll be using pre-recorded music for worship, which for those of you online, it will seem the same because it was recorded here in the sanctuary, Uh, but for those of us in here, we'll be watching a video uh, alongside for worship. And finally, um, today is Pastor Cornell's 86th birthday. So happy birthday. I mean, 79th birthday. 79th birthday. Um, so happy birthday to Pastor Cornell, and, uh, who continues to serve faithfully, not only here at Crescent, but with some other churches that have contacted him throughout the years, just walking, along, uh, walking alongside people, caring for them. And, uh, and as well, Cornell continues to tell me of people when he and Linda used to run the group home who continue to be a part of their life. Cornell continues to be a part of the lives of youth from 20, 30, 40 years ago, which is really quite remarkable and praiseworthy. So happy birthday, Cornell. All right, that is all the announcements I have for this morning. We'd welcome for those of you in here uh, to greet one another with a fist bump, elbow bump. Uh, feel free to wave to the camera. Uh, just come in front of the, sanctu- or the uh, communion table here and you can wave to the folks online and welcome them there. And for those of you online, uh, welcome one another, greet one another in the comment section. Let's greet one another and we'll come back for the call to worship. Whoops. There we go. Okay. I think I pressed the button in my pocket too many times. Um, As we begin with worship this morning, the call to worship is found in Psalm 103. If you're in the sanctuary, you're welcome to stand or remain seated uh, through the worship, but let us begin together. Psalm 103 reads this. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion? Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles? The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Let's praise the Lord this morning together. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above, praise his name. the 
go. But I was reminded now, maximum age is 120. So I got a few years left to go. It is amazing, though, that as I listen to television and they giving honor to all these great men who passed away, most of them were much younger than I am today. So in the power of Christ alone, I stand here. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have once again to come together to worship you. And Father, as the song says, in the power of Christ alone, that's the reason why we're here. Father, we're here because we want to be touched by you. We want your holy presence to be present, not just to be present, not just that we may feel his presence, but also that we may be touched by him. So we thank you, Father, for the privilege that we have to come together and worship you. I just pray that we may bring honor and glory to you in everything we say, in everything we do. Father, as we come together and uh, approach your heavenly throne, Lord, we realize that how do we pray, really? How do we pray for one another? And we truly should pray for one another. During the day, in this past week, has been an example that we hear of someone's need. But we really don't know much about that person we ask to pray for. And we don't seem to be able to pray for him or her from the depths of our hearts. Lead us by your Spirit as we seek to become more adept in praying for others. Stir compassion within us so that we may feel that anguish and pain. Ignite mercy in our souls for then that we might be stirred to action on their behalf. Father, magnify love in our hearts so that we might see others in the light of the redeeming love of Christ. Remind us that praying is more than uttering words. It's more than feelings. It's acting in Christ's name on behalf of someone else. Call us unto you this morning and teach us to pray. Lead us out to service in Christ's name. Keep us faithful to the commitments that we have made to the church. Inspire us to serve Christ beyond the doors of our church as we go out into the world where needs and lostness meet us everywhere. Wherever we go, make us aware of the call that we accepted to be servants of the Lord. And it is in his name that we bring before you the needs of our church and its people. We pray, Father, for the leadership of our church, that you will give them great wisdom to know what to do. And that whatever is happening, that it may be accord according to your divine will for our church. Father, we're blessed with good leadership. We pray that you continue to bless them so they in turn can be a blessing to us. Father, at this time we pray for those who are ill amongst us especially with the virus, Lord, that's going on, that people are being affected by it, either directly or indirectly, like the two girls from India who called in that 
uh, to say they couldn't make it today because their roommate has the virus. And Father, there are many people that are in the same position. There are people of our church who have been in touch with those who are infected and are un unable to come. And other people don't want to come because they want to avoid the danger of being infected. Father, you're in control. I just pray that you speak to each one of us, especially in these trying days, that, Father, we may know your will for our lives and those around us. Father, I thank you, Lord, for, for those uh, who have been operated on and have, been, have had uh, tests taken this past week. We thank you for Daryl, who had uh, Daryl Reba, who had uh, an operation on his eyes, who had a cataract removed. And Father, as he's at church today and uh, looking bright, we thank you for the success. And we thank you for his mom. Father, how uh, you have made it possible for the hospital to find ways and means that they can control the pain. And Father, that she's home now, rejoicing once again. And Father, we just thank you for her. Father, we thank you for Art, who had an operation on his ear, who had cancer removed. And Lord, the results are that uh, they got all the cancer. And we just pray that it will remain that way. Father, we pray for those who, amongst us who, who are suffering, not just from the virus, but are suffering from pain, whatever it may be. And Father, they don't often share it, but I pray that you be with those people, that you will touch them in a very special way, that they may heal, see and feel the healing power in their lives. And Father, in spite of all the problems they have, they're still able to smile and encourage us. So be with those, Father. I pray, Father, that you be with Beth Kaiser. Uh, Lord, uh, she was accepted in God's waiting room, Delcina. I just pray, Father, that her number will be called soon so she can go home and rejoice being in heaven with you. Father, I pray that you be with the Duplessis, as they've gone to, uh, to uh, South Africa, they will give them traveling mercies, that you will keep them safe and healthy and bring them back to us again in a few weeks' time. Father, I pray now that you, could, that you be with Pastor Tyler as he speaks to us from your word. Father, I thank you for the Apostle John who was given an insight in heaven and was able to write it down. It's not always clear to us, Father, and that's why we need uh, uh, people like, pa uh, like Pastor Tyler who can, can uh, and, uh, and tell us what is meant by all these strange things that are happening and things that we can look forward to with great anticipation. Father, be with us now. Bless us abundantly so we can bless those that we come in touch with this coming week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Is that better? Yes. Uh, today we're reading from Revelation 6 and Revelation 8, verse 1 to 5. We'll be reading about the seven seals and the golden censer. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come! I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was giving a crown and he rode out as a conqueror, bent on conquest. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! 
Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come! I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed, just as they had been. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? When he opened the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel, who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it to the earth. And there came pearls of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word. Thank you, Trinky. Bad day to have to read scripture. It's a terrible passage in many ways. As she was reading it, if you stopped and heard what was being read, <clears throat> there's a lot of destruction, a lot of fear, a lot of chaos going on. And so as we wade deeper into John's revelation, or what would be better be uh, said is the revelation given to John, this we have to keep in mind, that this is a book filled with numbers, strange creatures, all sorts of battle and imagery that has caused tension throughout the centuries. It's caused concern. It's caused us to have misguided attempts to predict when Jesus is coming back and when the end of the world will be because of passages like this right here that Trinky read for us this morning. But as I've said before, and I'll continue to say, the book of Revelation is a letter to the church about Jesus and from Jesus. It was given through the Apostle John to encourage and, and warn the church. And so we have to ask the question, what is Jesus trying to say to us? How is he encouraging us through this passage? Or more rightly, how is he encouraging the church in the first century, those seven churches? How is he trying to encourage them and warn them? One other thing we need to keep in mind is that the word revelation is actually a Greek word that could be transliterated to read apocalypse. And so that's where we get this word apocalypse. 
And what apocalypse means is not the destruction of the world, not the end of the days. It means unveiling. It means opening. It means removing the cover of. And so as John is given this apocalypse, this unveiling, we are seeing behind the curtain, so to speak. Daryl Johnson, former pastor of First Baptist out in Vancouver and author, teacher, biblical scholar, likes to say about the book of Revelation that there's something else going on behind the scenes, that things are not as they seem. As we look out on the world, both here in the 21st century and and as we travel back over the last 2,000 years, as people looked out on the world, there was stuff going on, there was chaos, there was wars, there was earthquakes, there was all these things. And what Revelation is telling us is that things are not as they seem. There's something else going on behind, and that's what this revelation is for us from chapters 1 through 22. Last week, we talked about Jesus being the only one worthy to break the seals. He was the lamb who was slain. Remember, John was distraught that there was no one worthy to open the seals until an elder points to him and says, look over there. There is one worthy. It's the the lion of the tribe of Judah. And John turns around, and what he sees is not a lion full of power, not a lion full of might, but he sees a little lamb who looks as if it's been slain, has been offered as a sacrifice, standing on the throne with God. His worth, his worthiness, was not one of power and might and strength, at least not as we would measure it. His worthiness was not one of position and title, although he had those as well as the Son of God. The worthiness that John sees, the worthiness that he's trying to communicate to us, is the only one worthy to break the seals of the scroll of destiny, is the one who is holy and true. The one who offered his life for you and for me. And that's what John sees as he turns around. Not one of power, but one of sacrifice. One of God's power and God's wisdom, which to you and me are often foolishness and crazy talk. The one worthy is the one who is equal to God, who is standing on God's throne. And so now as we look at these seals being opened, one of the first questions that might come to mind for us is, what, is, what are the beasts saying when they call out these four horses? These four horses are, for whatever reason we were talking about in, at the end of prayer meeting this morning, why is it that these four horses seem to infiltrate pop culture? If we speak of the four horses of the apocalypse, almost anyone has heard of that somewhere, in some movie, in some story. Why is it that this has stuck in people's minds. Although I don't know the answer to this, to that, I do know that there's much that Jesus wants us to know from them. And the question that has come to mind for me is, why do the beasts seem to call them forward? These worship leaders that are around the throne, they say, come, and a horse seems to come. I wish I had an answer for that as well. But as I read different contexts, different uh, writers on this, the jury seems to be out on that as well. Johnson, Daryl Johnson, says he feels, as he reads it in context, the living creatures surrounding God's throne would not be calling forth destruction on the earth. What he says they're calling forth is that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Come, Lord Jesus, is what he's interpreting that to mean. But others, scholars, read it just as it seems very plainly in the text, that as the seal is broken, the beast that is surrounding the altar calls forward these four horses. But whether they are calling for the kingdom of heaven to come or whether the beasts are calling forward what is very evident throughout, what should be obvious to all of us is that there is a battle that's going on. And so let's quickly look at these seven seals. There are six seals at first, and then we'll jump into the heart of the matter at the end. Just to give us some context, the first seal is broken. A white horse comes riding out. He has a bow, but he's given a crown. He goes out as a conqueror, conquering. The second horse, the red horse, the rider is given power to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another. He's also, to do that, given a sword. The third seal is broken, the black horse comes out and in his hand is a balanced scale and he's, someone is proclaiming a quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, 
A denarius was a day's wage for a working class citizen, which meant that for a full day's work, all they were getting was one measure of grain. The economy, in other words, has been blown apart. How could someone making a day's wage feed their family when all they can buy is a little barley or wheat? At the same time, the oil and the wine are not touched. Those who would have more, the rich in this case might be getting richer, the poor might be getting poorer. This rider on the black horse, the economies are destroyed. The fourth seal, a pale green horse or a greenish gray horse, a sickly horse, comes out. And the horseman is named Death, and the place of the dead, Hades, is following right close behind. And authority is given to this rider to take a quarter of the earth to kill by the sword, famine, plague, and wild animals. I want you to hear, and I hope I emphasized it enough, that in each of these seals, as the horse rides forward, their agent of destruction is given to them. They have no power on their own. And to me, that's the first word of encouragement that Jesus is giving to the church, that despite uh, conquerors conquering and peace being broken and economies collapsing and death showing up and destroying people's lives, they actually have no power and authority on their own. These horses these, and their riders are given the authority from somewhere else. The text makes clear, Craig Coster says, that the horsemen represent conquest, violence, economic hardship, and death. And these are genuine threats for the people in the first century and have remained genuine threats to you and I today. Which is why attempts to predict the onset of the end times on the basis of these visions have consistently failed. There's always been rulers trying to have conquest. There's always been, since Garden of, of uh, Eden in Genesis chapter 3, there's always been people lacking peace with one another and fighting against one another. There's always been economies up and down and poor not doing so well and the rich seemingly getting richer. There's always been death since we've been kicked out of the garden because of our desire to be God rather than to submit to him. And so instead of discussing the probable significance of each of these horses, although it seems clear what's trying to be represented by them, those first listeners in the first century and for us, we need to recoil in the terror of the reality of these horses coming forward. That the bloodshed and war and famine and death gallop furiously around us day in and day out. We hear it on the news. We see it on the internet. There is constantly battles raging. As we hear these words, we need to be reminded that things are not as they seem. After these four horses ride forward, the fifth seal is broken. And again, we have to keep in mind that this is not not necessarily a linear progression. It's a progression of the seals being broken, but not in terms of events that are happening. The fifth seal, we hear the cry from the martyrs, slaughtered because of God's word and testimony under the altar, the place of sacrifice to God. And these martyrs cry out, How long, O Lord? And the response is, Wait a little longer until everyone has come to join you that should be with you. And they're given a white robe and they're given a crown. They have been washed in the Savior's blood. They've been told to rest a little longer, that the work of God will be complete. And so despite the destruction, they are crying out how long. The response is not, I will finish all of this right now and I will take you away from the destruction that you're seeing the response given to them is, hold tight. There's more to come. There's more saints out there. Justice would not come until all who should be saved are saved. Justice would not come until all who should be rescued have been rescued. As the sixth seal is broken, a violent earthquake ensues. The sun turns black. The moon becomes like blood. Stars fall to the earth quickly like figs from a fig tree. And if you can imagine in your mind, the sun crashing into the earth, the images of utter destruction. Every mountain and island was moved from its place, and people of every background hid in caves and mountains, crying out, Hide us from the face of the one who is seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, because their great day has come. Who 
can withstand this? Who can withstand death and Hades going out, conquerors being conquered, peace being removed? Who can withstand the mountains collapsing? And at that, John's given a pause. The story, the music has risen to such a crescendo. The feeling for all of us should be who can stand when utter failure is going on. When the mountains are being moved, not because of the prayers of the saints, but because of the work of some shadow force that is going on. Where destruction ensues, when we face life's uncertainties, how do we stand and who is able to? And that's where we get a pause in the story. We get chapter 7 that shows up. And in chapter 7, there's a story of who it is that can stand. We get the 144,000, again, numbers in the book of Revelation are symbols. And so what God is saying, if you read through chapter 7, and I encourage you to do so, is the completion of God's people are brought forward. John sees 12,000 from every tribe. He sees innumerable people from every place and age and space and time. Of time. He sees, he sees the completion of God's work. That is who can stand, those who are under the blood of the Lamb that's standing on the, crowd, on the throne. But one of the questions is why did the seals have to break at all? Why couldn't God just clean everything up and not have to allow this disaster to unleash on us? I want to look at a couple of passages from Jesus' ministry. Because throughout Jesus' ministry, just about above anything else, what he proclaimed was that the kingdom of God was at hand. That he came to begin the kingdom, to start God's kingdom. That it was coming and it had now come. And that was in fact so important that if you read the Gospel of Mark, that's where Mark jumps into right away. Within 15 verses, Mark says this. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. This is verse 9 at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him into the wilderness where he was tested for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he had the wild animals and the angels attending to him. After John was put in prison, this is verse 14, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Mark dives in right at the beginning of his gospel to say Jesus came to earth. He was swept out into the desert to engage in battle against Satan and then to proclaim that the good news has come, that the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Mark wastes no time in getting to Jesus' purpose of proclaiming the kingdom of God. And here in Revelation chapter 6 and the the chapters ensuing, we see this kingdom of God battling against the shadow empire. We see the kingdom of God confronting the evil that has been throughout the world since uh, Genesis chapter 3. And so as Revelation begins, Jesus' depiction, his image that he's given to John is one of strength, but one of humility. It's one of standing in the middle of his churches and holding stars in his hands. And from that position, Jesus gives an address to the seven churches to warn and to encourage them about who they are and what they're up to. John's given this vision of the throne room and worship of the one seated on the throne and the lamb who was slain, the only one worthy to break the seals. If God's kingdom is going to come into completion, this scroll that the one on the throne holds must be opened. Because it's the scroll of destiny of God's completed work for his creation. And as this scroll is opened, as God's work is continued to be worked out, a battle ensues. The shadow kingdom has been worked into the world. It's corrupted things. It's made us all, as John says, or as Paul says, we have all fallen short of God's glory. Because we traded our crown for the, this shadow empire. And so if you remember Jesus, when he prayed for his disciples in the, in the garden, in John chapter 7 as it's recorded, he says this, I've given them your word, and the world has hated them. 
For they are not of this world any more than I am of this world. My prayer is not that you take them out of this world, but that you protect them from the evil one, that they would be safe when the battle goes on. Remember the opposite sort of feeling that John and James, the Zebedee brothers, had as they were approaching Jesus? And his mother actually approaches them and says, hey, when you come into your kingdom, when everything's good, will you put my sons at your right and your left? She was thinking shadow empire kind of strength. And Jesus turns to them and says, rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Not so with you. Don't behave like the shadow empire. Don't behave like this world. When Jesus is before Pilate in John chapter 18, Pilate's accusing him and or asking him, Do you, you're a king, you're of a kingdom, where are you from? And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would be fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. And so as the scroll is open, as the seals are broken, as the, the scroll is about to be fulfilled, we're given this vision of the empire that comes to battle the kingdom of God. It's only natural that when God's kingdom comes into completion that he's going to face resistance. As the seven seals are opened, God's kingdom purposes are being revealed, which inevitably stirs up Satan and his shadow kingdom who fight against it. No different than when Jesus was in the desert for 40 days. No different than when you and I face temptation and struggle each day. And so as these horsemen ride out, conquering, elimination of peace, disastrous economics, and death, The saints are crying out for justice as we've been called to do from day one. And absolute turmoil for those who cannot stand on the day of judgment ensues. So what are we to do? Or is the language at the end of the breaking of the sixth seal, in the language at the end, at the breaking of the sixth seal, who can stand? As Jesus was walking, A man comes up to him, and you might be familiar with this interaction, and he says, Teacher, what good thing must I do to earn eternal life? Why do you ask me what is good? Jesus replied, There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. Jesus replied, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, if you want to be all that you have been created to be, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Get rid of all earthly connection, all things that are replacing me in your life, Jesus says to this young man, and follow me fully. Trust in me for all things. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus turns to his disciples and says, Truly, I tell you, it's hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Who then can stand? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Chapter 7 is the answer to the disciples' question of Jesus. Chapter 7 is the answer to the, those who are facing the onslaught of the stars falling from the sky and the mountains being moved in their question of who can stand. Because chapter 7 brings us back to the throne room where the God is seated on the throne and the Lamb is standing with Him and the creatures These four beasts and the elders, the 24 elders, and a multitude of people are worshiping God and God alone. In the midst of the destruction and chaos, John and his hearers are shown that there is protection for those who bear the seal of God and reminded of who sits on the throne. There's nothing you and I can do to earn that seal. There's nothing you and I can do to be good enough because remember when John looked for who was worthy to open the scroll, the only one that was found was the lamb who was slain. Those who are in Jesus Christ are the ones who can stand. 
the ones who are made holy by his shed blood and broken body, the new covenant people, which we will remind ourselves about what that means in a few minutes as we gather around the table. Jesus is worthy to break the seals because he is holy, and those who are in him, who have surrendered their life to him, who trust them with everything, willing to sell everything and follow him, he makes us worthy as well. That we might be able to stand through the difficulties and challenges of life that we face each and every day. And after being reminded of this, he comes back to the seventh seal. The lamb breaks it and there's silence for half an hour. Upon the, upon the completion of the breaking of the seals, there is rest. But then seven angels are given seven trumpets, and another angel with gold incense came and stood by the altar and has given lots of incense to offer with the prayers of the saints in front of the throne. Smoke and prayers go up into God's presence from the angel's hand, but then fire from the altar is slung in the earth, and we get the thunders and rumblings and lightnings and earthquake, which John saw as he looked at the throne in chapter 4. God is at Things are not as they seem right now in life. And this first series of seven for us is a reminder that despite the destruction that comes, economic collapse and death, unfair economics and conquest, God is seated on the throne. Who can stand? The ones who trust in the Lamb. Who can withstand the onslaught? The ones who know that he is amongst them. Jesus Christ is the only one worthy to open the seals. He is the only one able to protect us and walk with us through the midst of life's challenges. But remember what, Johnson, what I quoted Daryl Johnson at the beginning. Things are not as they seem. For now, the seventh seal brings us back into the battle, reminding us that despite those who are sealed, that we are sealed in Christ, there is a battle raging on that we are at war, but it's not with one another. It's not with government authorities. It's not with other countries. The real battle that is going on is the battle that John or Paul reminded the Ephesian church, one of the churches that John addresses. At the end of his letter, Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes against the shadow empire. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, when we are faced with difficulty in any of life's challenges, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand once again. Stand firm then, Paul says, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The only way we can battle the difficulties that we see right now is to trust fully in Christ and his ways, righteousness, holiness, that we hear and we understand through the reading and living out of his word. Conquering, oops. Finally, the only way we can stand is to pray in the spirit, with the Spirit on all occasions, Paul says, with all kinds of prayers and requests. Lift our lives and the lives of those around us to God. And as we do, be on the alert because you're going to be tempted. You're going to be challenged. You're going to be invited back into a battle that you cannot win, that only Jesus can. With this in mind, as you're praying, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. Revelation 6, 7 in the beginning of chapter 8 is a reminder that God is on his throne. And it is his word of warning and encouragement to us. It's a warning because when we're not in Christ, we will not be able to stand. When terror and fear are at hand, we will crumble.
but it's an encouragement for those of us who are in Christ that when we trust him with everything we have, when we continually turn to his ways, despite the tribulation and the difficulties we face daily, weekly, and yearly, we can stand confidently knowing that the one who has created the world has sent his son to redeem it. And that on the day of judgment, when all tears will be wiped away, you and I will be judged worthy because of the blood of the Lamb. And so where are you at? What struggles are you facing? Are you hearing the words of warning Jesus sent to the churches regarding their struggles with love, lost love, idolatry, and complacency and comfort? With the things that you currently have, have they become God in your life? Or are you hearing the words of encouragement from Jesus that despite the difficulties and the external cultural pressures you may feel, to hold on a little longer, Jesus is coming and you can stand with him. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for this word to us that we find in the book of Revelation. We pray, Lord, that we would, get not, we would not get lost in the imagery in the weeds, that we would study it, to hear your voice, to understand what it is you're trying to say to us, as you were trying to say to those seven churches in the first century. We pray, Lord, that as we face temptation, as we face struggle and difficulty, that we would turn to you, and that we would constantly be turning to you, that we would know how to navigate difficult circumstances. And when we're in great circumstances, that we would not put our trust in things of this world, but would celebrate and say thank you for all that you've granted us. And so we pray, Lord, help us to sell all we have, to eliminate false idols from our life, and trust fully in you, to lead us and guide us, to worship you as you are seated on the throne. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Gather round the table, the new blood, and remember the new covenant in the blood of Christ. And so I'll get to come down here. They can adjust the cameras as needed, and we will share in communion together before our song of response today. This is the Lord's table. This is symbolic, but even more than that, it's a reminder. And even more than that, it bears witness to the one who invites you and me to gather around it together. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, he blessed the bread, he broke the bread, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After dinner, he took the final cup, He said, this cup is my blood. It's the new covenant in which you are being redeemed. As you drink of it, continue to drink of it, knowing that you are my people and that I am your God. And so whenever you gather, Jesus said, as the people of God, as you gather around the tables, you share in the bread and the juice, as you remember his death and his sacrifice, his resurrection, you gather proclaiming that he is coming back. You gather proclaiming that he has died for you. You gather as the martyrs under the altar to bear witness to the kingdom of God is at hand. And so as we take this bread in this cup, come before Christ in prayer. Invite him into your life to reveal the areas where you have gone astray and to affirm the areas where you are faithful those areas that of brokenness, lift them up to him. Those areas of waywardness, turn away from and return to Christ. And so I'm going to lead us in a prayer and I'm going to create space for everyone to pray on their own and then we'll take the, the bread and the juice together. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you today. We thank you for your son. We thank you for the opportunity to gather around this table once more not only here in the sanctuary, but for everyone at home as well. We gather as one body to remember you, to remember the sacrifice you made, but also, Jesus, we gather to proclaim you as your body gathered together to bear witness to the life you have given us and the transformation that has taken place. 
And so we pray, Lord, that as we come before you individually, reveal to us the areas where we need to return to you. Reveal to us the ways in which we need to repent. And we thank you that we can, for you are our God, and we are your people. Let's pray to him. Thank you, Jesus, that you hear our prayers. Renew us for the week ahead. Amen. He took the bread. He blessed it and broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup that this is my blood, the new covenant in which you will stand. Drink it in remembrance of me. We thank you, Lord, for your body sacrificed and your blood shed that we might be washed clean, to walk holy and pure, to be judged as you are judged, worthy of the presence of God. Thank you for this chance to gather, to proclaim and to remember that you alone are Lord. Savior, because you are the Christ. Amen. For our final closing song, if you're in the sanctuary, feel free to stand or remain seated, and then we will close with announcements and benediction following.
to carry out the duties that you've called us to and the mission you've invited us and commanded us to participate in. And so we pray, Lord, for those uh, that are able to give, that your blessing would be upon each one of us, that we would give as you have led us uh, for the work of your kingdom in this place. We thank you, Lord, for all who do the work of counting it and sorting it and making sure everything is done properly. We pray your blessing upon them as well. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Just a few quick announcements. Uh, again, the youth are coming home from uh, Gull Lake this afternoon, so pray for them as they travel. Uh, we'd invite the congregation to, pray, uh, to call one another. If you're thinking of someone, just call them up. Ask them how they're doing. Uh, if you need a directory, don't have one, please talk to Ange, and she will make sure to get you one. Uh, prayer meetings are continuing Sunday mornings uh, here in the building and Tuesday evenings at 7.30 via Zoom. All the info is on the website. Um, and the annual meeting is coming up on February 27th. Uh, it'll be here in the sanctuary as well as via Zoom, so everyone can participate in whatever way they are most comfortable. And finally, uh, two final things. One, tax receipts are done. Uh, you can get them in the mailboxes in the back of the sanctuary. If they haven't been picked up in a couple of weeks, we will mail them out to, to those uh, that, if they're still here, uh, we'll mail those out. So if you're in the sanctuary, feel free to pick them up. If you're able to during the week to come pick it up, um, they are ready to go. Uh, and finally, Lunch Bunch is going to start up again. Uh, the first meal is going to be on uh, the first Sunday in March, and it's going to be at the Spaghetti Factory, I believe. Is that right, Cornell? Sp Spaghetti Factory. And so uh, Cornell has the details. It'll all go out in email as well, so all that information. Um, so the first Sunday in March will be uh, the resumption of uh, gathering together at, at this case, Spaghetti Factory, to share in some fellowship and food together. I think that is all the announcements I have. Uh, let's close with the benediction. Lord God, we have gathered as your people. We pray that as we go from this place that your spirit would lead and guide. You would convict and comfort. You would that through us, your message would be proclaimed. That the kingdom has come and that you, Jesus, are king. And so I pray that the love of the Father, the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit would go with you as you go forth from this place to bear witness to Jesus, the King. Amen. Have a fantastic afternoon and week. Go in peace.